Genshin Impact is a game that revolves around the seven elements of the gods. Or does it? Because at the end of the day, Genshin's core gameplay is all about the intricate elemental reaction systems that the developers at Hoyoverse designed and already stated that they have no intention of expanding further following the release of Dendro. But is that really the case? Well, uh, no it's not, however, slide 2. Genshin is almost definitely going to get characters in the future that are not built around or tied to the currently established elemental system of the game. In fact, I'll go a step further and say that we are almost definitely going to get at least two new elements in the future, and this is the bare minimum. But how on Teyvat could I be saying that there are two more elements that are missing? After all, everything that currently takes place in Genshin, everything that we have seen and happened so far, all of the characters we meet and play, even the gods themselves are all tied to the seven elements, Nemo, Geo, Electro, Dendro, Hydro, Pyro, and Cryo. There are seven Archons, seven Dragon Kings, seven Nations, the Primordial One created seven celestial entities, four shadows of itself, and three moons that reflect its light, and I hope that you are paying attention because I just gave you the answer to the missing two, but I will also mention that even Amun who might possibly also have been able to manipulate the seven elements says that the world is bound by a cycle of seven sage monks which he sought to break that being said the reason i keep putting these two missing elements in quotation marks is that they might not be elements at all not in the conventional sense at least However, for all intents and purposes, when it comes to how they will interact with Genshin's gameplay in the future, which is the ultimate interest of this video, they can be classified as elements nonetheless. By this point, I know that most of you would have already realized that I'm talking about the two fundamental powers acting in the background of the lore, the powers of the Abyss and Celestia. For now, let's just call them Darkness and Light for the sake of simplicity. And now, I am going to start unpacking the core components of this video piece by piece to properly present to you my take on how these two elements are going to be implemented in the future, and more importantly, how they will interact with the gameplay of Genshin Impact based on the evidence we have so far from the game's own story and Hoyoverse's design trends and philosophy. Starting with the true protagonist of Genshin Impact, Dainsley. Because this guy is not only a sexy mysterious soldier from a dead kingdom that will generate a lot of revenue when he eventually comes out, but uh, because, well... <laughs> He is actually a key factor in almost every argument that I'll present. Okay, I'm going to be real with you. Uh, this video is going to be complicated and convoluted as hell because it covers a wide variety of topics including mythology, philosophy, quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, Genshin's lore and gameplay, and also a little bit of Christian theology. This means that in order for me to present what I want to say to you clearly and coherently, I must split my explanation into its basic components and talk about those step by step so that we can connect them all into one final concept. Now, this topic obviously does not need to be this complicated, I can just half-ass this entire video and tell you that Kanria characters use Abyss, Celestia characters use God Power, and most of you would understand the gist of it. But because I hate myself and because I want to produce a respectable video that meets my quality standards, we are going the long way. So strap your seatbelts because you are in for a ride. Alright, the first thing I need to do is to clear any doubt regarding the playability of Dainsleaf in the future, because if we cannot establish common grounds on this matter, then it will be difficult for me to convince you of everything else which I'm about to talk about in this video. Thankfully, however, it is extremely easy to deduce that Dainsleaf will almost certainly end up as a playable character, and it is not because he's a popular character with extremely unique model. After all, Rosaline was a popular character with a unique model, and look what happened to her. Regardless, the reason we can almost be certain that Dainsleaf will be playable in the future is, well, because he was one of the nine featured characters in the Tifat chapter storyline, and so far in Fontaine, six of these nine have become playable units. Diluc Ningguang, Ayaka, Sino, Lene, and Lynette. Which almost undeniably confirms that the remaining three, Ian San, Pulcinella, and Dainsleaf, will also be playable when their respective nations are released. And the reason Dainsleaf is so important to this video is because his existence confirms two important things. Future characters from outside of the seven nations will be playable, and secondly, certain future characters won't use the conventional seven elements of the gods, as evidenced by the seemingly random gibberish displayed on Dainsleaf's character card, where his elements should have been. I will get back to that later, keep it in mind. And from what you have seen so far, looking back at the cutscene where the Traveler fights the Abyss Hydro Herald from the We Will Be Reunited quest, we got to witness a little bit of Dainsleaf's power in action when he strangled the Abyss Herald with some kind of telekinetic abyssal power. And the reason I can confidently say that Dainsleaf uses the power of the Abyss is because that same Abyss Herald that we fight calls out Dainsleaf and tells him that he reeks of the same corruption as him. 
This abyssal power that Dainsleaf briefly displays is both very insignificant and significant at the same time. The reason it is insignificant is simply because it does not really tell us much about how Dainsleaf's power operates, but at the same time it is significant because it confirms that Dainsleaf uses abyssal energy and by extension it links the set of indecipherable symbols from his card to the abyss itself. Remember these symbols, again we'll get back to them later. Now, going back to the two missing quote-unquote elements in Genshin, I call them dark and light respectively, however, this naming convention will change significantly as the video progresses. In fact, I'm about to change it right now. But before I do, here is a general theme that the storytellers tend to use when writing stories involving the duality and struggle between darkness and light. It goes as follows. Darkness seeks to turn all that there is into itself, and light seeks to annihilate all that which is not itself. And for the most part, this general thematic concept fits well within Genshin. The Abyss devours, corrupts, and engulfs and assimilates, while Celestia eradicates, cleanses, and purifies anything that does not align with it. However, after all this talk about darkness and light, it is time to completely change their names, because from now on, moving forward, they'll be referred to as Quantum and Imaginary. So, it is time to talk about Quantum Mechanics. Yeah, this is one of the few videos on YouTube where you are going to hear the words quantum mechanics and Genshin Impact in the same sentence. What a way to honor the legacy of Oppenheimer, Schrodinger, and Max Planck. Quantum mechanics is an extremely intricate and expansive field of chemistry that primarily describes the behavior of particles at an atomic and subatomic level. And it involves a lot of mathematics. Like, a lot of math. First, let me give you an overview of how the concepts of quantum and imaginary are presented within the Hoyoverse. In Honkai Impact 3rd, there exists a vast primordial space known as the Sea of Quanta, which is a chaotic mess of entropy that destroys and consumes reality, while the imaginary tree is an entity that actively seeks to absorb the Sea of Quanta via its roots, and it is also where all worlds are created. The Sea of Quanta, as described in Honkai Impact's lore, is also the closest thing we have to the Abyss in Genshin, while the imaginary tree is the closest thing we have to Ermin Soul and the power of Celestia. Hence why I'm making these comparisons. Now, I will give you a very brief overview of how quantum mechanics operate, but before I do, please note that what I'm about to say is extremely simplified. Quantum mechanics covers a massive variety of subjects. There are 59 proven mathematical models, each describing various fundamental properties of quantum theory, and I hope that I don't need to tell you this, but I'm going to include it nonetheless. Miho's presentation of the subject within their games is nowhere near perfect, and they often violate or neglect several essential principles of quantum mechanics. But again, we are talking about video games here, and the settings are all fictional, so it is important to suspend your disbelief and remember that the games are loosely inspired by quantum mechanics and are not actually based on quantum mechanics. With that being said, when people hear the word quantum, many think of it by default as chaos or randomness of outcome. And that... Uh, cannot be further from truth. You see, quantum mechanics at the end of the day is a field of chemistry, and while randomness is part of it, it is not a chaotic randomness of outcome, but rather a mathematically predictable randomness of probability. And this is where I think most people tend to have a misunderstanding of the subject. Now, I could do what every YouTube channel under the sun does and explain the following using cats, but I personally think that this type of explanation is imprecise and only leads to further confusion down the line, so I will just say it in a more direct way. In classical physics or thermodynamics, if you have a soccer ball on the field, you know exactly where the soccer ball is and you have a clear vision of all of its physical properties such as position, potential energy, angle, or momentum, etc. And if you kick the ball with a certain known force, you can accurately calculate its mass by measuring the displacement of the ball over time and obtain its velocity before it starts to decelerate. And since momentum is force multiplied by change in time, you can divide that by the maximum velocity of the ball to obtain its mass. Um... Or that, or you can just put the ball on a scale and divide its weight by the acceleration of gravity, both work. The point I'm trying to make is that thermodynamics is very logical and very straightforward. But if I'm to explain the same concept in quantum mechanics, well, things on a macroscopic level no longer work, so we need a much, much, much smaller system than a soccer ball to work with. Uh, take this hydrogen atom, for example. A single hydrogen atom is also known as a proton, and a proton actively seeks to attract its polar opposite, the much smaller electron. Electrons around an atom inhabit discrete orbitals depending on their energy level. Now, just like our soccer ball, say you want to measure a certain property of the electron, such as its position. This very electron can exist around any given orbital at any given time all the time, and you won't actually know the real position of the electron until you measure it. But the very act of measuring the electron will disturb its state, meaning that if you measure the position of that same electron again, you will notice that it likely shifted to a completely different orbital. 
You see, in quantum mechanics, there is something known as the uncertainty principle, developed by Werner Heisenberg. It is any of a variety of mathematical inequalities asserting a fundamental limit to the product of the accuracy of a certain pair of measurements on a quantum system. This basically means that the more precise your measurement of a certain property of a particle is, the more imprecise your measurements of its other properties become because of the very act of measuring that particle is going to disturb its behavior. And when the electron shifts from one orbital to the next, it does not move to it, uh, no, it quite literally teleports, as if it instantly pops in and out of existence. Which wouldn't make sense, because that means electrons now no longer behave as particles, but rather as a wave. And this takes us to Max Planck, arguably one of the greatest humans to have ever lived in terms of how his scientific contributions have changed the human world. And one of his mathematical laws which he developed, Planck's law, is a fundamental basis of all quantum mechanics. Planck's law states that energy of a wave is equivalent to the Planck constant multiplied by its frequency. In other words, wavelength is Planck's constant divided by momentum, and momentum is mass multiplied by velocity. And this is extremely important, because now we have a clear and undisputable relationship between wavelength and mass. All right, all right. Let us quickly wrap this subject and get back to Genshin Impact because I'm sure that most of you are currently wondering how the hell does any of this relate to Genshin? So, because an electron can exist across different configurations at the same time, we can't know its real state unless we measure it by applying a mathematical operator and plugging that into the wave function of the Schrodinger equation. We repeat these measurements an enough number of times to create a probability distribution of where the electron could be, and this distribution will have a peak which is the most likely position at which you will find the electron, while all the other positions are also likely just with a lower percentage chance. And the more accurately you measure the particle's position, the less accurate its other properties become by virtue of the uncertainty principle, and if you treat the particle as a wave and measure its momentum, then you lose accuracy on its position. And this is why the electron can exhibit both particle and wave-like behaviors at the same time. However, if we go back to Planck's law, you will notice that we can apply this mathematical model to virtually uh, anything, not just an electron. And that means everything in the universe can exhibit both particle and wave-like behaviors, including you, a human being. And no, I'm not talking about aligning your body wavelengths like those chakra gurus tell you that's complete nonsense and it's a different topic altogether. But in the grand scheme of things, this makes sense because from Einstein's equation, we know that mass and energy are interchangeable. So this leaves us with only one question. If everything can function as a wave, why does quantum mechanics only work at an atomic and subatomic level? Why can't we notice it in everyday life? Well. It does work in our everyday life. It's just that if you look back at Planck's constant, you will notice that it is an incredibly small number, meaning that the larger your object is and the more energy it has, the closer your quantum measurement approaches zero and the less relevant it becomes. This does not mean that quantum mechanics becomes inaccurate. It just means that quantum mechanics becomes less relevant and thermodynamics becomes more accurate. In other words, quantum mechanics always exists. It is the truth of the universe, which underpins reality while thermodynamic prevails as we scale up. And finally, it is time to tie all this back to the abyss. But before I do, here's another reminder that Hoyer vs. Quantum Element is merely loosely inspired by quantum chemistry. Again, this is just a video game with creative liberties. Okay. So Genshin's world is built upon three primary realms. There is the void realm of the abyss, the elemental realm, and finally, the human or physical realm. However, according to the Before Sun and Moon from Enconomia, uh, the human realm wasn't always there. It was put in place by the Primordial One after defeating the seven dragon kings of the old world. This means that the void realm and the light realm are the origin point. And going back to the Sea of Quanta, which is very likely connected to the void realm of the abyss, remember how I said that quantum mechanics always exist in the world around us, and it's just that we don't notice its effects except on microscopic objects and the larger you get the more accurate thermodynamics becomes at conveying the properties of nature well within the sea of quanta there exists the imaginary tree and the imaginary tree seeks to absorb the sea while the sea seeks to flood the tree keep this flooding imagery in your mind we'll get back to it later the imaginary tree is inspired by a theory in quantum mechanics called the tachyonic field which contains within it imaginary mass 
that can move faster than light, which doesn't make sense. This imaginary tree constantly absorbs the basic building blocks of reality from the Sea of Quanta and turns them into comprehensible and legible worlds within the Hoyoverse. In other words, the imaginary tree turns potential chaos into absolute order. And who built the human realm outside of the boundaries of the Abyss? Well, it was the primordial one who shunned the void and its fundamental inconsistencies, creating a realm outside of its boundaries by splitting the cosmic egg. And this becomes extremely interesting once you remember the fact that the primordial one in Genshin is also known as Fanes. And in Greek mythology, Fanes is a god of light and creation who emerged from the cosmic egg created by Konos and Ananke, and then rose from the abyss and gave birth to the universe. Fanes is also depicted with a snake wrapped around him, which could be interpreted as his own mother Ananke, who herself was born of chaos, the first primordial being of the universe. Does this remind you of anything in Genshin Impact? Now, the Night Mother in Genshin Impact could be Ananke, and could also be Nyx. However, I'm not interested in this theory right now, I'll cover it in a future video. You see, Fanes in Genshin Impact must have also been a being who emerged in some way, shape, or form from the Primordial Abyss, but then shunned its chaos and sought to create his own ideal world by invading the Light Realm and using it to form the Human Realm. A realm of order, not one governed by probabilities and configurations, but one governed by laws and heaven heavenly principles. And once that was done, he must have forbid the inhabitants of the human realm from learning about the origins of their world, from knowing what the fundamental truth behind the world is, lest they go back to it, back to the reality that Fane so utterly despised. So, Fane split the two realms with what he called the Veil of Sin, and any who breaks it would be a sinner. He marked the realm of his birth as a realm of evil and branded its ruler with the moniker of the Night Mother, then finally outlawed any information about that world as forbidden knowledge. And now we are going to get into the spicy part, so pay attention. Because just as the imaginary tree absorbs the Sea of Quanta and turns it into order, the Ley Lines and Ermisil in Genshin Impact absorb the Abyssal Filth and turn it into stable data that can be processed within the human realm. Once again, converting chaos into order. And both Ermisil and the imaginary tree are inspired directly by Yggdrasil, the cosmic tree of Norse mythology. And remember all the talk about how the seven elements are a lie and how there are actually nine elements? Get this, Yggdrasil in Norse mythology connects the nine realms. In Genshin Impact's case, that would be the seven elements along with the quantum and imaginary, which from now on we are going to change again and call them chaos and order. Now, we actually have two distinct possibilities here. Either chaos and the abyss are the origin of order, similar to how the Greek chaos gave birth to Ananke, who in turn gave birth to Fanes, or the duality of chaos and order is something that existed since the very beginning. But I want to play with the first possibility a little bit. And to do that, let us quickly backtrack to what I said earlier about the nature of wave-particle duality of subatomic units, and specifically the concept of quantum leaps, which electrons can do between orbitals. Also, just to be completely clear on this teleportation thing I mentioned regarding quantum leaps, um, we don't actually know if electrons truly teleport instantaneously between energy levels. Physically speaking, it makes sense for energy loss or gain to produce a smooth transition over time, but due to specific limitations, we have not yet observed for that to be the case. So we just slap on the uncertainty principle as a temporary explanation and call it a day. Uh, listen, as always, everything has nuance to it, especially a topic like this. But back to Genshin. Remember these weird space tunnels that the Abyss Heralds can open? Well, when we first meet Dainsleaf inside the chasm, he informs us that the Abyss Order can use these tunnels to teleport anywhere they want across the vat. And he said that it acts like a network from the inside. This concept is inspired by yet another quantum theory known as quantum entanglement. And the fact that the Abyss Heralds utilize this technique is interesting on many levels. One of those levels is the fact that the starry night sky background of those portals is not much different from the one we see in Domains. But unlike the messy and chaotic network of the Abyss Order, which even Dainsleaf cannot navigate, domains are very much structured locations with discipline and, uh, well, you get it at this point, order. And you know what else classifies as a domain? Makoto's Realm of Consciousness, where we go back in time to grow the sacred sakura tree in the future. And if you remember when the Traveler asks Yaimiku to help him get back into the Realm of Consciousness, Yai says that one must be extremely careful and focus hard on the location they wish to reach, otherwise they could completely get lost along the way. Much like Dane, huh? Baal and Beelzebul are gods, archons in fact, both of them. 
and both of them are able to manifest their consciousness into domains. Considering the fact that Bal and Beelzebul are Archons of Celestia, it would not be too far-fetched to assume that they can inherit certain techniques from higher gods of Celestia and potentially even Fanes itself. As we established earlier, Fanes' power is that of order, or by its other name, the imaginary. And if we take the word imaginary to its logical conclusion, it comes from imagination, and imagination cannot exist without consciousness. But what does this say about all the other domains on Teyvat? Could they all, or at the very least their pathways, be constructed out of quantum abyss through the imaginary force? Yet again, converting chaos into order. And let us take it even a step further. If the Primordial One really originated from the Abyss, what does this say about his world, Tevat? With that being said, if chaos represents the primordial nature of the Abyss, while order represents the absolute nature of life, and remember that Fanes is a god of creation and light, which are fundamental to life itself, then where does this leave the seven elements of the gods? Consider a light spectrum. You have the seven colors of the rainbow, which we all can see and observe and comprehend. But beyond that spectrum lies the infrared and the ultraviolet, two wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation which human eyes cannot perceive. If we treat the nine elements as such, we would have a spectrum of raw elemental energies where the seven elements of the gods will exist within the natural boundaries of the makeup of the human realm, while the quantum and imaginary, which in a sense do not belong within the human realm, are difficult to digest and understand. Building on that logic, the seven elements would be fundamentally linked to the forces of chaos and order, just like how the light realm of the elemental realm bridges the gap between the void realm and the human realm. But we are not done yet because I'm about to go full insano style. You see, the duality and struggle between order and chaos isn't only limited to the primordial one and the night mother. It is something that has been hinted at since the very beginning of the game with the golden power of Aether and Lumine, which at this point most likely represents a combination of all the seven elements in their purest form. And that is very likely the power of faints, the power of order, the perfect amalgamation of all the seven elements in their most refined state. When it comes to chaos though, well, in the party quest released in patch 3.6, we learned that the power of the abyss corrupts the elements of the gods, reforming them into distorted states. But I have a different proposition. Remember how the imaginary tree absorbs the Sea of Quanta and converts its matter into stable worlds? This implies that the tree feeds on the Sea of Quanta and uses its power to create something else entirely. But that something else originated from the Sea of Quanta. It's just that the tree processed it and changed its makeup. And this brings us all the way back to this symbol, the Enslaved's Element. Earlier in the video, I stated that this is incomprehensible random gibberish that is not part of any known language, neither in Tevat nor in the real world. This means that it is information that we cannot process. It is knowledge from beyond Tevat, forbidden knowledge. But mama raised no pussy because we are going even further. If we take Dane Sleeve's element and then split it like this, well, I think you know where this is going by now. We have seven symbols, some of them resemble Greek letters, and each one of those seven symbols most likely corresponds to one of the seven elements, not in their corrupted forms, but rather in their original primordial form as they are supposed to be in the abyss. And this is unlike the power of the primordial one which refines and reshapes the elements from their basic building blocks into the way they operate in the human realm just like the imaginary tree does with the sea of quanta. And that would imply that what the abyss is doing is not corrupting the human realm but rather reclaiming back its elements and breaking them down into their truest and most basic original state. And all of a sudden the crazed ramblings of the abyss lectors when they they constantly tell you that you will know the quote-unquote truth starts to make sense. And even beyond that, going back to Ananke, mother of Fanes who rose from chaos, she was also the mother of the Morai, the three fates who govern destiny. And if we link that back to the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg in quantum mechanics, this connection between fate and the abyss, which Nicole hints at... Unfortunately, the fate of Tevat cannot easily be changed. Perhaps a god may have a slim chance, but for anyone else, <sighs> who can say? When a small animal runs into a tree trunk, though the tree may sway, it is not displaced. The same is true of fate, like a vase that falls to the ground. Whether it is broken by a cat or by a bird, 
The result is still a broken vase, is it not? History does not change easily, but human hearts can. Believe your own eyes. Only that which you see is true. What is unseen is but an illusion. Well, I think you get the point by now. But going back to order and the power of fanes, Aether and Lumine are not the only characters in the story that can manipulate the seven elements. You see, there is one more character in the story who we know about that happens to be linked to all the seven elements in one way, shape, or form, and that is Deshret, better known as Amun. And guess what his title was? God of War and Order. And this sentiment becomes even more clear once you realize that Lilpar, a jinni created by the goddess of flower, the lover of Deshret, says that the Traveler physically resembles her former master, Amun, meaning that the Travelers and Amun are connected in more than just their elemental potency. But we are not done yet, because Amun also represents Amun-Ra, the Egyptian god of the sun who is devoured by the god of chaos, the serpent Apep. And in Genshin Impact, Amun was the one who brought forth forbidden knowledge into the human realm, destroying his empire and spreading chaos amongst the populace. In other words, the god of order became the god of chaos. All in all, there is more to Deshret than what meets the eye. <laughs> Get it? Deshret meets the eye? Uh, no? No? No one? Uh, okay, never mind. But the theme of the sun with Amun here is very important, because once again, the sun is a star and a source of light, which facilitates life. While Fanes was a god of light in creation, and both Aether and Lumin are associated with the morning star, which represents Lucifer, whom God casts down from heaven. And Paimon, the closest devil to Lucifer, and who, by the way, bears a weird resemblance to how Fanes is described in Before Sun and Moon, is one of the 72 demons of the Ars Goetia, whom God subjugated for the king of Israel, Solomon, the son of David. And the bloodline of David is extremely important, because that is the same bloodline that eventually gives birth to the Virgin Mary, who is the mother of Christ, who in turn is the incarnation of God in human flesh. But then you have to take into consideration that Ananke, the mother of Fanes, who was born from the primordial chaos and the snake wrapped around his neck, is a serpent. And in Christian theology, serpents are heavily associated with sin, uh, because it was the serpent that tempted Eve to eat from the apple tree and obtain forbidden knowledge, which she shared with Adam, causing both of them to commit sin. And this becomes more confusing once you realize that the Celestia we know in Tevat is based on New Jerusalem, the Kingdom of Heaven. And in Genshin Impact's Gnostic Chorus, Barbados tells us that once upon a time, the King of the Kingdom of Heaven sent his heir to retrieve the Genesis Pearl, which could also be the Cosmic Egg of Fanes. But then the heir was deceived by a serpent. But then I have to go back into Greek mythology because the second who came might actually be a representation of Zeus overthrowing the Titans. And then we must factor in Asmodeus, another demon under Solomon who overthrows Lucifer and rules hell in his stead for a while. And then this reminds me of the Abyss siblings stating that they want the Abyss to engulf the thrones of heaven, which is very similar to the Sea of Quanta, seeking to flood the imaginary tree and retrieve it back, which is also based on the Nordic tree of Yggdrasil. But we are not done yet, because we also need to factor in Chinese mythology and philosophy, because of course the game's core universe is based on Chinese philosophy and mythology, why wouldn't it be? And then, and then, and wait, L Legend of Saha? What is Legend of Saha doing here? What the fuck is the Legend of Saha? Why is Genshin Impact based on a Pixel PNG game from 2010? What is this? What is happening? You know what? You, fuck this shit. I am done. I don't even care anymore. I'm, I'm actually going insane. <sighs> the point I'm trying to make is that there is probably some kind of connection between Amun, Aether, Lumine, and Fates. And we are likely to learn about it in the future. But going back to Dane's leaf, when we meet him in the chasm, Dane informs us that his curse was given to him by a god and it operates on a different level of reality. This actually makes a lot of sense, because as we established earlier, the imaginary power is not conventional to the human realm, and this further implies that whichever god was responsible for further cursing the Conrians uh, also controls the force of order and by extension the purest form of the seven elements. Finally, I want to mention that I'm not implying that chaos and order are individually more powerful or more important than any of the seven conventional elements, because as it appears, all of the nine elements are fundamental forces of the world of Genshin. Also, I know I talked about Honkai concepts a lot, but I'm not saying that Honkai and Genshin are directly connected. I personally don't think that is the case. 
Finally, some of you might mention Azocyte, which is elemental energy in its purest draw state, extracted directly from the Ley Lines and used as energy source by Conria. Could that be the same golden power of Celestia? Well, it could be, but I'm not certain about that yet. But I'll leave it up in the air. Now, it will be interesting to see how Dainsleaf will play like in the future when it comes to elemental reactions, and he and other characters that use the Abyssal power might have one unique interaction with every element based on how the Abyss itself tends to break down and reform the elements into their primordial state. And uh, we can also include an Annihilation reaction with the Celestial Force, which in turn could have reinforcing reactions with all of the seven elements. What I am certain of, however, is that Fontaine will expand a lot on this topic, because the characters of Fontaine are already hinting at the existence of the forces of order and chaos through the new gameplay mechanics of Numa and Uisa, which share similar themes to the Abyss and Celestia. Also, Numa and Uisa powers manifest as needles, and needles make me think of the fates who weave destiny, but that's just some food for thought. Uh, oh, also, the Annihilation reactions of Numa and Uisa is very much similar to how the Abyss energies and the Divine energy in the Vrokasha Oasis annihilate one another, which is then reminiscent of Matter and Anti-Matter Annihilation, but that's, again, just another wormhole, and we'll see about it later. Dansleaf will definitely be one of the most interesting characters in Genshin, both in gameplay and in the lore that he is going to reveal in the future, because his existence alone means that we will get more elements in the future, which is really cool. And what is cooler is how much effort Hoyoverse writers put into their world building, which explains why their games end up becoming so popular in the first place. It is not just about the gameplay, but also about the quality of the content in the game itself, and as you can see, the quality of Genshin's lore is top tier. Now, if only the playable story reflected on any of this. But I digress. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this theory and speculation. If you have any ideas for how the elements of the Abyss or Chaos and Order will operate, then let me know down in the comments. And for now, that is all. See you in the next time. Take care.